Welcome, welcome one and all. Uh, happy Super Bowl Sunday to you all. Happy Puppy Bowl Sunday. Uh, whatever bowl game you are celebrating at home, thank you for pre-gaming with Tail Up Goat Wine School. Uh, we are going to continue uh, to uh, fill time here, as we always do with the first three minutes, which I, I think are the most riveting three minutes of wine school in their own way. Um, our very own Zoe Nystrom is here. Say hello to the people, Zoe. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Happy Sunday. Uh, Zoe, uh, for the uninitiated, will be fielding uh, questions, uh, ad administering uh, the chat, uh, and just generally holding court uh, from afar, drinking the wine. We are thrilled to have her back on this coast, uh, it should be said. Uh, Zoe joining us from uh, essentially across the street uh, from our Revelers Hour studio. Uh, all the more thrilled that we have some new listeners in the audience. Uh, big ups to the Going Out Gurus uh, at uh, the Washington Post. They uh, interviewed us and uh, wrote about us at length. And we uh, have some new audience members uh, for Tail Goat Wine School. We're grateful uh, for all of you joining us, whether it's for the first time or for the 42nd uh, love our wine school stands uh, as well. But uh, what a great day to spend a sunny afternoon. Uh, it's become sunny here after our snow uh, fizzled out. We are celebrating Portuguese wine. Um, and we have three flights we are going to work our way through uh, this afternoon. We're gonna trace a, a narrative arc here. So people often ask, you know, uh, which wine should I begin with? You know, will the order in which I drink the wines, you know, ultimately affect the way um, I experience them? It, it absolutely will, but uh, we tend not to get as worked up about that here. Uh, we like moving back and forth between individual wines. I always keep uh, multiple glasses uh, on hand. Uh, that's because, you know, I get wanderlust and I like to try a lot of things at once. But, um, you know, it is really illuminating to try uh, wines one against the other. So if you have multiple glasses at home, uh, I encourage you uh, to break them out and uh, to try uh, one wine against another. I, I think they serve as dramatic foils really beautifully, especially uh, when they come from the same genre, you know, red to red, white to white, uh, what have you. Um, we are uh, using uh, kind of, uh, we've got Zviesel uh, glasses here, uh, very nice stemware, uh, just, you know, uh, for the uninitiated in terms of the things we look for in a glass. Um, you know, we want a bowl that is sufficiently large to uh, be filled with a, a four to five ounce pour. Um, and you want the wine glass to be no more than a third full. So you have sufficient uh, space to aerate uh, the wine because that aeration is gold. Uh, it makes the wine uh, more expressive. Uh, it allows you uh, to access more of the things that make the wine interesting, especially for the sake of uh, this particular offering on the nose. Uh, you want something that's, you know, tapered at the top. So you want a glass that is you know, uh, uh, you know, thinner at the top than it is at its base, but um, it is not necessary uh, by any means to have different glasses for different wines. I love this multi-purpose glass, AP glass from the good people at Scott's Diesel. Uh, you find one glass you like that's sufficiently versatile and you run with it. Um, you know, don't feel like you need, uh, you know, a million different uh, glasses for different wines. You know, you don't need for the sake of this lesson, a Duero wine glass, an Alentejo uh, glass, you know, uh, God forbid, uh, a Kolarish glass, you know, uh, don't, uh, you know, be a sucker for uh, the Riedel, Scott Spiesel, uh, marketing teams of the world. Just find one good glass and run with it. Uh, whatever you do, though, uh, please uh, avoid at all costs uh, the champagne flutes. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's kick it off here. Um, Zoe's going to be administering the chat, so keep the questions uh, coming uh, over the course of the lesson. Uh, there are uh, no uh, poor questions, you know, only excellent questions here. Um, we are uh, thrilled to be with you um, this Super Bowl. Um, we uh, want to do a bit of shameless self-promotion uh, to kick things off here. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, thank you very much, Janice Carnival, for making that happen. And, um, you know, I want to say that if you haven't subscribed already to the Tail Up Goat Wine School YouTube channel, please do so. Um, I've been directing people to individual lessons uh, in uh, the course of my email responses, and I was particularly excited to discover this this week. So if you scroll down far enough on individual videos, then uh, you uh, access a, uh, a YouTube, um, you know, kind of a uh, 
kind of screen where they tell you uh, what people are also watching. So uh, Tail Up Go Wine School um, you know, uh, participants are also watching the mechanic who lives in his garage, extreme cheapskates, funniest cats, try not to hold back laughter, and Buenos Aires women dating in Ar Argentina. I think that's very exciting. So uh, all of you at home clearly love uh, cheap misanthropes, funny cats, and Latin women. I can get behind all of those things. Uh, good on you. Um, keep tuning in. Keep watching. Please subscribe. Incidentally, uh, I watched that cat video. It is hugely uh, entertaining. I highly recommend it. Uh, to you all, uh, if you have time to scroll down far enough on the Tail Up Goat uh, Wine School uh, portal. Uh, but without further ado, uh, we are going to kick it out as we are wont to do uh, with a bit of verse and naturally uh, a Portuguese poem uh, to kick things off. Um, there is um, just a, a breadth of amazing uh, Portuguese uh, verse out there. This comes from um, Portugal's great modernist, Fernando uh, Pessoa, a man of many uh, pseudonyms. Uh, he was a, a flaneur, uh, someone that loved to wander the streets of Paris, of Lisbon, to watch uh, the workaday urban milieu, um, to think deep thoughts and to compose a verse in his head. Um, this is a, a poem called Mar Portugues, um, and it goes, Oh salty sea, so much of your salt is tears of Portugal. Because we crossed you, so many mothers wept, so many sons prayed in vain, so many brides remained unmarried, that you might be ours, O oh sea. Was it worthwhile? All is worthwhile. When the spirit is not small, he who wants to go beyond the cape has to go beyond pain. God to the sea, peril and abyss has given, but it was in it that he mirrored heaven. Beautiful bit of verse there from uh, Fernando Pessoa. Um, Portugal, just a really gorgeous uh, lyrical language, um, you know, not unlike uh, Italian that way, just uh, a lot of um, amazing potential uh, for a really uh, beautiful rhyme scheme. And, and then there's a, a poem, um, you know, in its original Portuguese that has um, uh, a, a really uh, beautiful rhyme scheme that, you know, is, is next to impossible to properly capture um, in uh, English. There we go. We're gonna kick things off here um, with a, a short, uh, history of the Portuguese uh, nation, um, and uh, I think it's it's chiefly um, you know significant to understand uh, Portugal as a, a seafaring nation, as a, a nation at the western end of uh, uh, Europe, for some reason. Um, and a a country that um, you know is informed by its proximity to the sea, um, and in the early modern era, as its embrace uh, of uh, by its embrace of uh, exploration. So. The modern nation that we know as Portugal uh, emerged out, uh, first emerged out of the Reconquista, uh, the 11th, 12th, 13th century. Um, it is named after a Celtic uh, port, the port of Calais, um, and uh, it developed its own uh, language, uh, heavily influenced uh, by the Celts, actually, um, uh, much more so uh, than Castilian uh, Spain. Um, it uh, emerged out of the Reconquista and quickly developed an alliance with the English, uh, codified in the 1386 Treaty of Windsor, um, they have uh, remained allies ever since, which is uh, one of the longest kind of diplomatic um, friendships uh, in the world uh, to date, uh, the Portuguese and the English, their love of one another, uh, and uh, much wine flowed back and forth. Um, many English merchants have made a fortune in Portugal, um, and uh, vice versa, many an Englishman has gotten drunk uh, on Portuguese uh, wine. Uh, the Portuguese and the English uh, competed uh, throughout uh, the age of exploration over um, you know, overseas uh, domains, but the Portuguese had the first leg up uh, chiefly in the uh, 14th century, beginning of the 14th century under Henry the Navigator. Um, and uh, they you know, developed these trading posts all over the world. Um, uh, Fernando Pessoa, um, he name dropped the Cape. That was actually the Cape of Bojador, which is in uh, Morocco, and actually gives its name to uh, one of our wines that actually bears the poem, Mar Portuguese, that I read you today. But we'll get to this uh, a bit later when we consider the wines of Alentejo. And, um, you know, the Portuguese over time, you know, they had their sights set on these different, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, points of embarkation, uh, these different goalposts. Bojador was one of those. Um, and then eventually the Cape of Good Hope uh, around South Africa. And then uh, no one could hold them back. You know, they made their way to the Spice Islands. They made their way to the subcontinent. They made their way to Brazil. Um, and uh, they really ruled the world um, for the better part of a decade, uh, beginning in the 14th and the 15th century. But their fortunes waned um, thereafter, um, uh, even if the colonies endured. Um, but uh, they established this, you know, long tradition early on of both making wine in uh, these um, outposts in the Atlantic, 
um, and uh, being important traders of wine. So some of the most important early modern wine brands were Portuguese. Um, Madeira, uh, chief among them, uh, Port, uh, Carcavelos, which is uh, lesser well-known in the modern era, uh, Calarish, uh, again, which is lesser well-known in the modern era, um, all in their own time were hugely um, famous, widely traded, celebrated by our founding fathers um, in the United States, among others, and certainly by, uh, you know, the uh, merchants and robber barons um, of uh, the old world. Um, Portugal, you know, had a somewhat tumultuous birth into, um, you know, the, the 19th and 20th century, um, you know, that uh, set. Um, you know, I want to emphasize that, you know, uh, you know, Portugal has this long history, but, you know, kind of a, a sad modern history, you know, I'm encapsulated by Jansons Robinson, uh, you know, a great English wine writer who said, you know, kind of summed up succinctly Portuguese history in the modern era. For much of the 20th century, Portugal turned her back on the outside world. And uh, it's significant to understand that, you know, Portugal languished under dictatorship for the better part of the 20th century. Um, the uh, Dao born, and I'm gonna share a map here of, of different regions of Portugal. And uh, Portugal, hugely fascinating, uh, not least because for a relatively small country, hugely geographically diverse. You can see that, you know, we are, um, you know, seafaring people here, regardless of, you know, whether or not we are, are inland or not. You know, there is an oceanic influence, even if you're inland in a place like Alentejo. Um, you know, and our orientation is very much to the Atlantic, and we do very much think of ourselves as, you know, um, you know, being uh, in the shadow um, of the sea, and that informs, you know, our worldview and informs, you know, uh, Portugal uh, culinarily uh, in terms of, you know, the mackerel, the sardines, the salt cod that they continue to enjoy uh, to this day. But um, Dao is a central region here. Um, it was the birthplace of Antonio de Oliveira Salazar. Uh, he was the dictator um, who, um, in uh, 1937, um, uh, assumed control of Portugal and ruled for the better part of four decades thereafter. He came from a, a small um, winemaking uh, family. His family, they were great growers in the Dow. And uh, he, um, you know, chiefly uh, kind of launched this, uh, you know, kind of very ambitious uh, economic project to um, consolidate the vineyards of Portugal and to run them through these massive co-ops. Um, and he wanted to empower the farmers in that, but uh, it led to Portugal becoming a bit of a wine lake, um, a bit of a backwards um, place for wine. They were making a lot of wine. Um, they were drinking a lot of wine locally, uh, but none of it, uh, sadly, uh, was wine worth exporting. Um, you know, that said, um, you know, the glory of, you know, this kind of sad 20th century history is that Portugal never really adopted the grapes that caught on elsewhere. So, you know, your Cabernet Sauvignon, your Pinot Noir, your Merlots of the world that took hold in a lot of other uh, corners of the planet that had their own history of making wine, you know, and they never invaded Portugal. Portugal did not, um, you know, uh, kind of shed um, this authoritarian rule until 1974, 1976, finally uh, becomes a democracy, doesn't enter the European Union until 1986. Um, and it wasn't until it joined the European Union that this long history of these massive uh, cooperatives uh, making uh, tons of shitty wine, Mateus, Lancers, um, you know, all very effective international brands, um, but not, you know, fun drinking once you're past the point where you'll drink anything. Um, once you're past a point where, you know, you're just happy to get your hands on wine, you know, you want to be drinking uh, something else. And uh, the Portuguese uh, didn't really address that need until um, they joined uh, the European Union in 1986. And the EU uh, sent a ton of money their way uh, for the sake of modernizing these proud old vineyards that, you know, uh, during uh, the early modern era uh, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, um, had produced some of the finest wines in Europe. So uh, the Portuguese have spent, you know, the intervening decades uh, since uh, the mid 80s kind of making up uh, for lost time. And I love this quote from uh, Jancis Robinson. Uh, Jancis, I've name dropped uh, already. At some point, we will uh, get her on uh, wine school. Um, she is uh, uh, one of the, I think, the most profound uh, wine writers of our era. But she says about Portugal, um, which has become, you know, an amazingly popular uh, destination for, for tourists and snowbirds. Um, they're incentivizing, um, you know, uh, all sorts of folks to come from around the world to buy property there and, you know, take on EU ownership. You know, I want to get in line for that. Um, but um, she speaks to that uh, here uh, and says the recent touristic limelight uh, is a new experience for most of Portugal, a seafaring nation whose 
Uh, wines and vines are as dominated by the Atlantic as its people have been for centuries. Deeply local and continuing traditions include indigenous grape varietals that have only recently properly uh, uh, been evaluated and exploited uh, and may still travel under a number of different names. Uh, international varietals never gained a foothold. So as well as oceanic freshness, Portuguese wine has a not so secret weapon, original flavors. Original flavors, secret weapon, uh, look out. Uh, everybody. Um, so uh, I love that, you know, a uh, little hokey, uh, but, you know, a bit of prose there. Um, we're going to kick things off uh, and we're going to taste some wine because you've listened to me for the better part of 50 minutes. Uh, I hope that I uh, haven't given you pause uh, for the sake of, uh, you know, starting to drink um, because uh, you should uh, uh, drink whatever you want uh, throughout um, you know, uh, this class, uh, regardless of what you're talking about. But we're going to kick things off here um, with uh, wine from uh, the Duero Valley, uh, which is the most uh, well-known, most famous corner of uh, Portugal. Um, and uh, the Duero River uh, snakes its way uh, throughout northern Spain, um, called the Douro there, becomes a Duero in Portugal. Um, and uh, it snakes its way through uh, the northern uh, corner of the country. And uh, it carves its way, literally carves its way through this, you know, uh, very hard uh, schist and granite rock, which we're going to address uh, more fully uh, in a second for the sake of our first wine. And it empties out into uh, the Atlantic at Porto. So it flows uh, from uh, east to west. Now, uh, you might be thinking to yourself, um, you know, uh, if, you know, the wine, the most famous wine, Port, uh, the fortified, sweet, largely red wine that comes from Portugal, from this uh, corner of the world um, is is goes under the name of, of port. You know, uh, you know how did it you know um, you know come to be that uh, it actually hails from the Duero Valley? Well, um, in the uh, you know uh, ancient era, uh, people tended to think about wine in terms of uh, where it came from. Uh, you know, as far as the port of embarkation went, so Porto um, was where the port lodges were. It was where the wines were blended, and it was where the wines were shipped. Even though the grapes came from the Duero Valley, so that's why port is port. Um, and not Duero, but uh, for the modern dry wine, um, which became much more significant, much more popular uh, around the world uh, once uh, Portugal entered uh, the EU in 1986. Um, you know, for those modern dry wines, we tend to think uh, more in terms of, you know, the uh, designation of origin in the valley itself. And we're going to uh, pull up uh, a, a, a good, a valuable sub map um, for the sake of those sub regions. But uh, let's taste this first wine. Uh, we have a white wine. Uh, it is called Shisto uh, Illuminato. Um, and uh, that's not a very difficult one to translate, guys. That is just um, unlimited schist. Uh, so um, Luis Sabrea, uh, Sa uh, Seabra, rather, Luis Seabra, the winemaker, he made wine for uh, Newport um, for many generations, one of the most famous uh, porthouses um, in the country. Uh, unlimited schist, schist to the max uh, is, our, is our first one. Um, I love this wine. It's a, a blend of a number of different uh, native Portuguese grapes. Um, and, you know, it is typical of Portugal, especially the Duero, that you're not going to see single varietal wines. Um, traditionally, uh, port was a blend of a lot of different grapes. Um, and, uh, you know, they did that to hedge their bets from one vintage to the next, depending on how various grapes ripened. And they did that so, you know, different grapes could bring different qualities to result in blends. So it was more like, you know, experiencing a choir as opposed to a gifted soloist. But uh, without further ado, um, Zoe, who's a much better uh, uh, taster um, and explainer of wines than I am, uh, uh, you have this wine at home, Zoe. Um, you know, uh, you swirl it in glass, you taste it. Uh, this wine is aged 90% uh, neutral oak, 10% in um, uh, stainless steel. Hails from 30 to 45 plus year old vines. Um, uh, beautiful kind of golden hue to it. Uh, what do you taste uh, for the sake of this particular offering? <clears throat> I love how bright it is. Um, all of that, like lemon curd. Um, it has like a little bit of like that ginger candy chew to it. And that uh, crystallization like also makes uh, my mouth like salivate, same as those ginger candies. Um, I really enjoy that like yellow apple and all of those orchard fruits as well. And then again, that like kiss of the bee, little salinity, little briny saltiness at the end is always, um, is always welcome. Kind of balance out all of the fruit too. Totally. This is one of those like Chablis eat your heart out wines for me. Uh, it tastes salty and chalky in a really fabulous way. Um, we're going to give you the uh, money shot here on the schist. This is schist. 
Um, this is uh, schist in the Duero. Um, this is the local yellow schist. They have yellow and blue schist for those of you playing along at home. Uh, they have kind of different uh, qualities. Um, yellow schist tends to be um, uh, slightly um, softer uh, than uh, the blue schist, um, which begs the question, what's the deal with schist anyway? Well, uh, funny you should ask. Uh, schist is a metamorphic rock. Uh, bear with me. Um, to be a wine nerd is, uh, you know, um, concurrently to be a, a, a geology nerd. So um, schist is a fun one. Um, uh, schist is a metamorphic rock. So you've got three kinds of rock, uh, for those of you playing along at home. Uh, uh, sedimentary, uh, deposited by sediments. Shale is one of the most uh, widely occurring sedimentary rocks in the world. Shale uh, exists where you get deposits of layer upon layer, thin layer of mud over time. It's also called mudstone, and um, they get compacted. But shale is layered. Um, and then as shale uh, metamorphoses uh, under heat and pressure, those layers uh, get thinner and thinner and harder and harder. And it goes through increasing metamorphism, more heat, more pressure. Uh, it develops into harder and harder rock. First slate, then phyllite, um, then schist, then gneiss. Nice. And so schist is a very hard rock. And schist is schistous, uh, which is to say it's layered. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it uh, has these cracks. And uh, what is great about those, it's a very hard rock. These are very poor soils in the Duero Valley. There's, you know, barely uh, any topsoil uh, for the sake of these vines. And great vines are amazing uh, in their ability to thrive in nutrient poor soils. Um, and, uh, you know, they love to wiggle their rocks in uh, the cracks between these layers. Um, and, uh, you know, it requires um, the schist to be oriented, you know, kind of, uh, you know, up and down, north and south. If you get, you know, schistous bands that are located horizontally, then the roots have nothing, um, you know, to penetrate. Uh, but in these, uh, you know, kind of greatest vineyards of the Duero Valley, um, you get this kind of up and down uh, oriented band of uh, this yellow schist. And it gives these poor soils, but it gives these wines um, that are, you know, crisp and clean. Schist tends to give wines that actually um, are, are slightly fuller and fruited. They're actually slightly um, higher in pH, so the acid is a little lower, but by the same token, I think they have this, like, minerality uh, because they are in this, like, very nutrient-poor uh, environment. So uh, we talk sometime about limestone soils um, uh, in these classes, and limestone is very basic rock. Schist is very acidic rock and tends to give, you know, more basic wines, but concurrently tends to give these wines with this, like, bright you know, chalky, uh, acidic uh, quality. And then the other major type of soil in uh, the Duero Valley is granite, which is an intrusive igneous rock. So that's to say that uh, the igneous rock uh, cools in the interior of the earth as opposed to the exterior. Granite um, has no bands. Um, you know, it, it is just kind of a giant blob, um, giant mass, um, and it degrades into uh, sand. It's very difficult uh, for roots to penetrate um, uh, if it hasn't already degraded, but, you know, somewhat counterintuitively tends to give uh, more soft, gentle, perfumey wines without the kind of structure that uh, schist has. And, you know, you'll see a lot of the greatest producers in this region working with, um, you know, different vineyard sites. We're working with a bunch of different grapes here. So this is a wine that embraces Rabagato predominantly, 50%. Uh, which is the cat's tail, for those of you uh, keeping track at home. Uh, Cadego Gobeo, which goes by the name Godeo uh, in Spain, the Ocinto. And they each bring something different to the party. Rabagato is its full fruitedness. Uh, Gobeo, lush as well. The Ocinto Cadego, a little leaner, more mineral driven. Uh, but the different sites as well bring something different to the wine. You know, the schistous sites, you know, um, bring more structure, more acid to the party. Um, whereas the granite sites, um, you know, bring uh, more feminine perfume, uh, more fruit, a uh, slightly more delicate uh, kind of wine. And, you know, the wine ends up itself being the, um, you know, uh, kind of compilation of those parts. You know, you hope as a, a blender, as a winemaker, uh, in this case, uh, Luis Siabra, that the whole is greater than the sum uh, of those parts. Um, now we're going to taste a red wine. And, you know, I want you to, you know, obviously we're going from white to red. So there's going to be a huge uh, distinction between, you know, how these wines taste, what grapes they're from, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, obviously, uh, prima fascia, you know, this is red, this is uh, white. They couldn't be much, you know, more different, but try to look for that continuity. Try to suss out the Duero Valley in both these wines, because they're both wines that don't really see a lick of new oak. Um, this uh, second one um, comes from uh, Antonio Lopez Ribeiro, um, and I love the way he puts uh, 
um, the uh, the vineyard site, um, you know, right on uh, the label there, because uh, the Duero Valley is preposterously beautiful. Um, uh, these uh, various um, terraces uh, were carved out of the Duero Valley to make viticulture possible in the 18th century, preposterously steep sites. Um, this is uh, one of Antonio Lopez's Ribeiro's uh, uh, Lopez Rivera's uh, vineyards in the Duero Valley, um, but uh, this is somewhat unusual uh, as a Duero Valley dry red wine. It doesn't see a lick of oak, so there's some purity to it, and I think it's fun to taste uh, between these two um, to get a sense of how, you know, these schist granitic soils express between white and red grapes, but how there's some continuity um, uh, in that expression. So uh, what do you taste uh, for the sake of these two wines? I've always loved Antonio Lopez. Like this is the wine for everyone. I think that it can do so many things for so many people. It has that like nice um, like cherry bing note to it, but it is still like chock full of really good like fine graded uh, tannins to it. And then you have all of those like fresh herbs. So I think it balances those lines uh, very, very well. Um, whereas like the Pratt's goes like above and beyond and you get all of that oak integration and it's like very like textbook and very like stately, I guess. Um, and then you know, all of that new oak is incredibly visible. And I like, I really want to eat more of a steak with it as opposed to the Antonio that I could sip on after dinner and be perfectly happy. Yeah, so uh, Zoe jumped a gun a bit there and- uh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. She spoke, she uh, talked up the Crisea. Uh, Crisea is kind of like the screaming eagle of uh, the um, kind of a uh, Portuguese uh, Duero Valley uh, scene. Uh, it comes from Bruno Pratt's um, in the Symington family, uh, led by uh, Charles uh, Symington. Um, uh, these two books right here, Bruno Pratt's, um, the older gentleman, uh, formerly ran the Russo Codesternel, which is one of the most famous second gross in Bordeaux, Charles Symington, heir to uh, the Symington family, uh, the port empire founded by uh, uh, enterprising Scotsman in 1882. Um, uh, the Crisea is uh, from two separate vineyard sites um, in the Duero Valley. Um, and uh, they are uh, in uh, the subzone here. We didn't really get to uh, the individual subzones uh, for the sake of uh, these particular offerings, but there are three of them. So uh, this one's from uh, Sima Cordo. Um, uh, you also have Sima Baisha and then uh, the Duero Superior. Uh, but this one kind of smack dab in the middle of um, the Duero Valley is the most um, kind of highly regarded uh, of uh, the Duero Valley subzones. But two different vineyard sites uh, for the sake of the Crisea wine um, and kind of uh, spoke to what I was addressing earlier. So uh, you see Pinau, which is in the center of uh, Shima Cordo here. Um, and one of the sites, um, so you have the Duero Valley running east-west, but you also have important vineyards um, along these northern tributaries. Um, and uh, they have a, a vineyard site along one of these northern tributaries that's actually a cooler site, tends to give uh, more delicate, you know, um, uh, wines with a fuller fruitedness. And then uh, they have a, a north, facing site on the south side of the river. And that north facing, because you're in the northern hemisphere, tends to be a cooler site that give more structured wines. Um, but they are making this wine in a more modern style. So unlike Lopez Ribeiro, um, they're throwing a decent amount of new oak um, at this sucker. So this one is Triga Nacional uh, dominant. Um, you got this like Corey Haim, uh, Corey, who's the other Corey, Zoe, in the 80s? Whatever, whoever the other Corey was, but um, Feldman, Corey Hayne, Corey Feldman uh, situation here. Uh, I think Corey Feldman would be like the Triga Nacional, the Cab Saab of the um, Portuguese wine world. Um, uh, 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 Hayne would be like the Triga Franca, which is like the Cabernet Franc of the of the Portuguese wine world. Um, the uh, Antonio Lopez Ribeiro we drank earlier uh, is uh, Cabernet Franc or Corey Hayne dominant. Uh, the uh, Crisea is uh, Corey Feldman uh, dominant, so uh, uh, Triga Nacional uh, dominant uh, here, and sees a shit ton of new oak, 15 months in 400 liter French Barrique. Um, you know, uh, you've got to let Olive be Olive, uh, you know, the Bruno Pratt's of the world, they're just going to want to throw oak at things, but, you know, uh, I've said this once, I'll say it a thousand times, you know, um, you know, some wines wear it better than others, you know, it's like the S Weekly who wore it best, um, and what I think is fun about trying these two Duero red wines is that you see two different, very different styles of winemaking in 2015, uh, same vintage for both these wines, uh, but they both are really beautiful creatures. Um, you know, I think they appeal to different sensibilities. They both have something profound to say about the Duero Valley, um, you know, but, you know, they're very different uh, animals. You know, one more bombastic, one more bombastic, one with more of a new oak influence for the sake of the Crisea, 
Um, but, you know, uh, and, and, you know, one more elegant, one more, you know, sinewy, one more acid driven, you know, kind of briny uh, for the sake of Antonio Lobos Ribeiro's wine. But, you know, both God's Children, both, you know, very, um, you know, kind of purely um, and evocatively expressive of, um, you know, what the Duero Valley has to offer for the sake of its dry wines. Um, and, you know, uh, the Duero has historically been the source of, you know, the world's most famous um, one of the most famous, you know, fortified sweet wines port. But, you know, in the modern era, you see um, the vignerons of the area really doubling down on these dry wines and, and thinking more about, you know, what the individual vineyards have to offer. I, I like this quote uh, from uh, the Symington family, Paul Symington, uh, in particular says, you know, table wines, um, uh, they uh, have, have forced the port trade to see itself differently. Um, you know, when they were just shippers, it didn't make any sense to consider where the grapes came from because, you know, um, they weren't thinking in terms of, uh, you know, vineyard designation or, 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 or typicity. Um, you know, it was a profound change um, when uh, the port shippers, when those port houses who were buying from a lot of different people, when they became growers themselves, um, you know, the wines changed and the way they thought about the region um, changed uh, as well. And, um, you know, we are witnessing that transformation and benefiting from it um, as wine consumers here, because these are two great wines that you know, they're not inexpensive. You know, this is like 20, high $20 bottle. This is a hell of a, the Crisse is fucking expensive. It's like 60, $70 bottle. Um, but, you know, they make a, a, a second wine that's like 30-ish dollars. That's, you know, very delightful in its own right. So, you know, you get great value uh, in these wines as well in a way that you wouldn't in, you know, Bordeaux, uh, where Bruno Prats is from or where, you know, um, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, people with the means to afford it can buy from. But, uh, you know, Portugal, a great place to look. Um, for a uh, wine, you know, that is substantive, that does scratch that Napa cabbage, um, but, you know, uh, comes to you for a, a more uh, reasonable workaday price. Uh, Zoe, questions? What do you have uh, from uh, the chatters today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, since there are just so many um, students who are loving Mary Taylor everything, could you situate the Doro Red uh, from Mary Taylor with the Doro Flight and how it compares to Antonio Lopez and the Pratt and Symington? So that kind of compares um, uh, favorably, or it's, it's kind of comparable to the Lopez Ribeiro um, in, in my mind, though, in the sense that um, I don't believe Mary Taylor's wine uh, sees a, a lick of oak, um, which I think is super cool. And um, so for the uninitiated, Mary Taylor is uh, a friend of um, the restaurant um, and uh, she operates as a negociant. So she is someone that purchases fruit um, from uh, other growers. Um, and uh, she um, kind of bottles the wine under her own label. So all the labels, you know, they're very minimalist. They have this like beautiful script. Um, and uh, what she does is, is brings wine to market um, that are, you know, wonderful expressions of place, but she's able to do so at a bargain based on price. So um, we carry her wine that is 60% Triga Nacional, 20% Triga Franca, and 20% uh, Tinta Rorish, uh, AKA Tempranillo. Uh, and that one is uh, harvested by hand. Uh, it is foot pressed in large granite lagaris, uh, which we'll get to in a second because it's too fun not to. Um, but the aging is entirely in stainless steel. So um, I think that, you know, something that Mary really values in her wines that, um, you know, we equally value and love um, is that freshness. So, you know, Portuguese wines in the modern era, the dry ones, you know, a lot of them, like the Crisea, are dominated by oak. Um, and, you know, again, you know, like Us Weekly, you can wear it well, you know, but, um, you know, I think... Uh, like, you know, the Lopez Ribeiro offering, you know, it is nice to have something that is equally substantive and uh, elegant. And, you know, the Duero Valley is a region that is going to produce full fruit in a wine uh, almost uniformly. You know, they don't have to chase after that. And so I think sometimes if you don't do it, you know, um, you know well, um, if you're not, you know, uh, operating, you know, with a, a more delicate hand, oak can be overbearing. Um, and, you know, it can be, you know, like uh, gilding the lily. Uh, but, uh, you know, I love that Mary brings this wine to market um, and there's an elegance about it. And, and that is, uh, I think, one of her best values, uh, honestly. Um, I name dropped Lagarish. Uh, this is a Lagarish. So uh, they're these ancient, um, uh, they're either stone or cement in the modern era um, uh, fermentation vessels called uh, Lagarish, or Lagar, uh, L-A-G-A-R. Um, and uh, this is a stock photo but it was too amazing not to share with you all. Um, and I love like the various level of engagement um, in this picture. So, you know, you got this couple on the right, they're, they're feeling the music, they are into it. They're all about stomping the grapes here. 
you know, the couple in the middle, you know, they seem variously engaged, you know, the, um, you know, the dude, you know, he's kind of, maybe he's thinking about, you know, uh, the score of his like local football match, you know, she, you know, is making eyes at the photographer. I love the couple on the left, you know, they're the one I identify with. This is my wife wondering why the fuck are we stomping grapes? You know, we couldn't find a better use of our time uh, on, you know, a Sunday afternoon. What the fuck are we doing here? That's that's the the goal. But uh, at any rate, this was honestly the way that wine was traditionally made in the Dorero Valley. And a lot of wines are still stomped by feet. So there are still like, you know, the Lucy's of the world stomping grapes with feet in the Dorero. And actually there's like a shortage of that labor. So often they'll invite visitors to stomp, uh, you know, the grapes with their feet. Um, it's kind of plays a role in port too, fascinating enough. And I, I didn't know this until I was doing some digging for the sake of this lesson, but uh, the maceration fermentation process for port is actually very short because they cut it off. So port is a, what the Portuguese called a vino generoso. And we're going to taste another one of those in Carcaveiros later. But uh, generoso just means in, in Portuguese fortified. So they, um, it, it, it's a process you know, that the, the French have uh, adopted and they just add spirit, typically brandy, to a wine before the fermentation is finished. Um, uh, which means that a, a wine only gets to ferment for, you know, uh, you know, a period of days, you know, you know, four to five days, you know, but that four to five day window for a red is tremendously important because that's the window of time that you get to extract color and flavor from your grape skins. So you want to go about that if your, uh, you know, maceration window is shorter, very aggressively and uh, dancing um, on the grapes, um, you know, uh, especially if you're like feeling the music or if it's like, um, you know, like techno or, you know, or, or something that, you know, invites more steps, you know, is a, a very extractive, a very violent way to extract, um, you know, those uh, anthocyanins, all those pigments, all those flavor, um, you know, uh, flavanols, all those other, you know, phenols, all those like really important, you know, chemical constituents that make red wine as enjoyable as it is, that make port as enjoyable as it is, you know, you are fast forwarding that process by stomping on the grapes. So um, that's a big part of the region, uh, why it's such an important part of the local culture. But um, they still do that to this day. And honestly, like a lot of the wines that we're working with, um, I think these two are actually both, um, uh, this is definitely foot stomped. Um, a bunch of the ones we're doing uh, later are foot stomped. So, um, you know, yeah. I mean, what's not fun about that? Um, beat, uh, what else you got to <clears throat> um, Kate asked an excellent question about how Turrigan Nacional is one of the new seven grape varietals that's allowed in Bordeaux. Um, also, like Alvarinho is also allowed um, as of the as of the new um, appellation rules. Um, I was wondering what you think Turrigan Nacional might taste like in Bordeaux. Um, it scares me, Zoe. So um, I think it it it, uh, it makes sense to some extent because it's like. Uh, you know, Triga is a, a late ripening grape that does well in, in sunnier climes um, than a lot of the Bordeaux varietals. Um, if I was a French farmer, I'd be really pissed about it because I'm kind of old school about that stuff. And, you know, there are, you know, essentially six grapes that are supposed to go into Bordeaux. And we've lived with this recipe for, you know, a century and a half. So it's not, the recipe's not as old as people would have you believe. But, you know, it's a, it's a good recipe, you know? People are getting rich off this fucking recipe. And I don't think we need to abandon it that quickly. The other thing too is that, like, they have grapes in Petit Verdot, which is actually pretty widely grown in Portugal, um, in Malbec, um, you know, that are pretty well suited, um, you know, in, in, in Tanat, that are well suited um, to thrive in a warmer world. I don't think they need to double down on other people's, um, you know, uh, warm weather grapes. Um, uh, you know, so I, I, I am, you know, highly, um, you know, I feel like it's, it's, a debasement of Porto. Um, but, you know, I'm playing the Andy Rooney role here um, uh, as opposed to the more open, open-minded open uh, role. Uh, but, you know, I think more significantly, there are a lot of people looking at Triga Nacional in places like Australia, warmer corners of California, uh, places that experience a lot of drought um, uh, where they will need more um, heat resistant, drought resistant grapes as the, as the weather warms. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, um, uh, you know, kind of call out uh, the Bordelais for being more forward thinking about what will work in 2050 as opposed to what works now. Uh, what else you have? Um, that's it for specific questions on the do uh, Doro, but I did want just to let everyone know since we also have some newcomers to um, put all questions in the chat so I'll be able to um, ask everything, uh, Bill. Um, so I'm irrationally excited for the next component 
of, uh, of our instructional here, uh, Zoe, because um, this allows me to indulge one of my favorite uh, and great wine loves, which um, uh, as longtime listeners will know is wine aged in clay. You got it. So we are bouncing from the Duero Valley to Alentejo, Alentejo. Uh, Alain, so the, basically the reason, uh, like the region encompassing the, the Tejo, uh, which is a, a river that winds its way uh, uh, through this kind of central corner of, of Portugal. But um, uh, it extends to the sea, but in terms of where they make wine, uh, it's all these subregions: um, uh, Borba, uh, Porto Alegre, Redondo, uh, Mora, Valiguera, uh, Vidiguera. Um, and it is a hot, dusty corner of the country. Uh, and whereas historically in the Duero Valley, you have a, uh, a region that is defined by a lot of small uh, parcels owned by many small growers, you've got um, uh, larger estates uh, in Alentejo. Uh, and uh, chiefly, uh, historically, um, uh, you know, recent history, uh, they are famous for uh, cork enclosure. Uh, they're not famous uh, for uh, wine. Um, uh, it is a less historic region than Lisboa, which we'll kind of close things out with, and the Duero Valley. Uh, they're better known for cork. Uh, if you've never seen a cork tree um, denuded of its bark, this is what it looks like. I can remember the first time I looked at a picture like this, I was like, oh dear God, <laughs> they're stripping a tree of its dignity. Um, uh, it is a, a renewable resource. So um, this tree will produce another batch of cork in about seven years. Um, uh, and uh, the harvest is strictly regulated. Um, you will rarely, if ever, find a Portuguese wine bottled without a cork because it is such a important part of their uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, culture um, uh, in, in the country, um, but uh, equally beautiful. Uh, but Alentejo has these huge uh, plantations, um, these massive estates. Uh, it is hotter, it is drier uh, than the Duero Valley uh, to uh, the north. It's not uniformly hot and dry. Um, we're actually going to start with a wine from uh, kind of a northern corner of uh, the Alentejo. Uh, the first wine is a blend of both uh, kind of uh, native varietal, Intriga Nacional, which we tasted for the sake of uh, our wine from um, the Duero Valley, um, and uh, three more kind of like broadly uh, international uh, varietals. So we've got a blend here of Syrah Petit Bordeaux, uh, which is a, a historically a Bordeaux varietal, Cabernet Sauvignon, which is uh, very much the uh, Bordeaux uh, varietal. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Triga Nacional. So Syrah, Petit Verdot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Triga Nacional. Um, uh, for one year, 70-30, uh, split on New Oak, uh, American and French. Um, uh, American and French Oak do different things. We're not going to dive down that rabbit hole uh, today. Uh, Zoe, uh, let's try this one out. Um, how does this compare, uh, in your mind, to the wines that we just tasted from uh, the Duero Valley? And what's instructive about it? Um, I think you're maybe wanting to talk about oceanic influence here, perhaps, if I'm trying to pick up what you're putting down. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's from, you know, both oceanic and, and non-oceanic. So, you know, it is actually, you know, it's from uh, inland, but, it, you know, there is an oceanic influence because you're in a northern corner of the Alentejo, um, as opposed to uh, a more a more southerly one uh, for the sake of, of this particular wine. Um, the soils are, are more limestone heavy, um, which is unique um, uh, for this uh, corner of Alentejo. Uh, it's uh, in a region called uh, Estremoche. Uh, we're going to pull up, uh, we can pull up a, a dedicated map of uh, Alentejo so you can get a sense uh, exactly uh, where um, we're at here. Um, and I think we can uh, identify uh, actually uh, this particular estate um, as I uh, share screen. I hope this is as dynamic and enjoyable for you at home as it is uh, for me here. But you got Estremoche here in Borba. Um, and you can see here, um, uh, the uh, unique estate, uh, Dona Maria Vinos, um, just uh, south of uh, Estremos here. Um, our other wine uh, is going to be from further south, as I scroll down, um, from uh, Erda de Rochim, uh, which is right here in Bidiguera. Um And this northern region, uh, it is, is a cool climate uh, than uh, the southerly one, um, but uh, it is, you know, warmer uh, than most parts of the Duero Valley, um, although there's quite a bit of variance within the Duero Valley. Um, how does this wine compare to you to uh, the one that you just tasted? Um, in the uh, Crisea, and I'm going to pull up the bottle. So uh, for those of you uh, uh, drinking at home, uh, we're drinking the Donna Maria. The Donna Maria here um, uh, at the moment uh, is the, the wine of uh, the moment. Uh, Zoe, uh, what do you taste uh, for the sake of this one? I've always loved the Erdade Dodo theme. Um, I love the fact that it has that, you know, olive oil on top to kind of stop the... 
you're spoiler alert, Zoe. You're, she's totally spoiled. You stole my olive oil thunder. Uh, we're tasting the, the Donna Maria. What are you tasting the, the Donna Maria? I'm so sorry. I silly started with a white. My apologies. Um, I really enjoy the Donna Maria. I thought it was really ethereal. Um, I thought that it was really light and kind of savory, but you get those like really nice tannins to it. Um, I have here just like capsation, 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 all of those vegetal notes. Um, it's super, super fresh. And it like kind of reminds me of like Cab Franc in that way. Uh, yeah, so that capsation squared thing, um, you know, is very much actually an American oak imprint. I said I wasn't going to talk about American oak, but uh, American oak can do that. Um, you know, new oak can do a lot of that as well. Um, I just kind of like how bombastic the Donna Maria is. Uh, this is state historic. You saw a picture of it earlier. Uh, it was purchased by um, a, a you know, pretty affluent Portuguese dude who sold his family's estate to um, the Rothschild family of Lafitte fame. Uh, and then he made this, you know, uh, his uh, next project thereafter, which is kind of nice work. Um, if you can get it. Um, so we're kind of tasting reverse order here. This would be the biggest of the bunch um, from uh, the Alentejo region. Um, and, you know, kind of, you know, some continuity coming off the wine from the Dreo Valley that we tasted earlier. Uh, moving on now to the uh, Beaujador. Uh, so you can talk about your olive oil here, uh, Zoe. Um, and uh, this is uh, wine in Anfora. Uh, so Anfora Alert, this is the winemaker. But it should be said that both uh, the Erdan de Rochim and the Beaujador are made by the same uh, beautiful man. Uh, I had the chance to travel uh, in uh, Georgia, the country, mind you, not the state, uh, with Pedro Rivero. Uh, Rivero. Uh, he's on the right here. Um, that is his wife, um, uh, Catarina Viera, on the left, and it's her family that owns the land, uh, another larger state um, in the uh, uh, Alentejo. Behind them, you see what's called a tala. A tala is a clay vessel. Uh, the word itself comes from uh, the Latin, and I'm going to quote here, we're going to talk about this vessel. So this is the vessel in which the wine is aged. So we've gone from new oak barrels to this clay pot that dates from the Roman era. Um, and we're in a forgotten corner of a forgotten country. So we, we talk about Portugal as being this place that, you know, time forgot for the sake of the, you know, development of uh, Western Europe. Uh, Alentejo is a region that, you know, essentially Portugal forgot. So, um, you know, this tradition of making wine, which dates back to the Romans, survived there because, you know, uh, nothing else took its place. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, they're talking about the term tala. It comes from the Latin tinalia that refers to a large pot or vessel. Uh, they vary in porosity depending on the type of clay, uh, but they're used for fermenting uh, grape juice. They're used for storing olive oil. They come in a range of, of shapes and sizes. sizes um, you know, and they rarely um, get as big as a typical uh, wine tank uh, would. But, you know, um, in this case, you have a, a producer from the region, Pedro Rivera. He sees him as the safeguard of the traditional way of making wine uh, in these uh, vessels. And traditionally, the grapes are destemmed. They're thrown into these vessels. Um, uh, very often, the stems will be thrown in separately. Um, and the wine will ferment, and it's punched down. You saw... Uh, you saw um, Pedro with that big uh, uh, stick and he would punch down the cap on the wine and you know the grapes would circulate um, and uh, that would prevent um, honestly the wine from uh, uh, building up pressure and exploding um, out of the ceramic vessel uh, but after fermentation is finished um, uh, over the course of a week and a half to two weeks uh, that, that, that cap of skins and stems falls to the bottom of that clay pot and, uh, and then uh, the wine is drawn out through the bottom after typically six months to a year of aging, six months in the case of both of these wines. And uh, that, you know, layer of uh, skins and uh, seeds acts as a, a natural filter uh, for the wine. Um, and I think it's really fun to have tried the wines from the Duero, to have tried this wine um, that comes from an estate um, that was named for a former mistress of a Portuguese king. Um, uh, and... Uh, they're big, they're bold, they're bombastic, they're oaky, they conform very, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, well to our image of Portuguese wine and wine from these warmer corners of the world in the modern era to come upon something like this. And it's just alien. It's widely different. So um, it should be said, Zoe uh, stole my thunder on the olive oil after that fermentation is finished and the grape seeds and skins flow to the bottom. They will coat a layer of oil on top of this wine uh, because they have so much olive oil in Alentasia, they don't know what to do with it all, but also because it protects the wine from oxidation uh, during this process. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Zoe uh, talk you through tasting the Beaujador and the Herdado Rochim. These are made by the same winemaker 
kind of under different labels. The Beaujador owes its name to the, the uh, cape that we referenced in uh, that beautiful uh, 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 Pesal poem that uh, kind of kicked things off with. Um, you know, these wines for me, um, you know, I adore, they capture, you know, kind of the soul um, uh, of, uh, of, of Valentejo, but in this wonderful kind of, uh, you know, uh, sense that dates back to antiquity. Um, uh, so, um, you know, there's something primal, but, you know, hugely sophisticated uh, about both of them uh, by the same stroke. Uh, Zoe, what do you taste in the red first and, and then the white? Um, so the Beaujador, the red is um, really, really soft, but also all that serrano pepper and very, very savory. Um, I think that the fruit qualities are um, are more like grilled or stewed. Um, they're certainly like soft and supple, um, but there's just, there's so much more going on there. Um, I really enjoy the herbaceousness as well because it has that like eucalyptus, like minty leaf kind of a thing going on, which keeps it nice and fresh too. Um, whereas like the tannins and the texture of the wine is more chewy. And then that like really nice, um, like kind of soured acidity at the end, I think is delightful. Um, I thought that it was gonna be like too big of a wine the first time that I came across with it. Um, but now that we've probably, this is probably maybe the third vintage that we've had um, to taste through of the Beaujador. And I've really interest, I've been really interested to see how it developed. I think at first I said that it was like a BFR and I like stereotyped it as that. And I've just constantly been shocked. Yeah, for me, it's gotten more and more refined and it's really cool to, you know, over time develop a relationship with a, a grower. Um, you know, I love Pedro and, um, you know, he's a, he smokes like a chimney. I don't know how he tastes anything, but he has this very sophisticated palate and his wines have gotten more and more refined. Uh, this, this has this like crazy smoked paprika thing. Um, like the Portuguese have this puri puri pepper, you know, for those of you who've ever been to like the Nando's chicken, like, you know, it has this like wild, crazy red pepper thing happening. Um, that's like hugely evocative for me. Um, and sometimes equal Cap Franc, but in this case, you know, it just feels like a, you know, sun kissed Southern Mediterranean version of that. And then, you know, on the, it's a loud wine on the nose, but then on the palate, you know, it's like so lean and savory and racy. Um, you know, I love that dichotomy. Um, and then you have a white wine. Uh, uh, this is uh, orange wine alert uh, at home. So, you know, if this Pee Wee's Playhouse, uh, all the couches be freaking out right now because they know we love uh, white wine made on the skins for the, uh, you know, newbies. Uh, um, orange or amber wine is uh, wine made from white grapes, uh, but they leave the skins in the mix. So um, in this corner of Alentejo for the, the Vinos de Tala, the wines made from these clay jars, they make the red and the wine, red wines the same way. They leave the skins in the mix for the same amount of time. Um, they add the same olive oil. I I, I, we need to get some olive oil from uh, uh, Roisin. But uh, uh, um, so the, the texture of this wine is very different than the texture of a typical uh, white wine. Uh, what do you love about the white, Zoe? Oh, steadfast, baby's first orange wine, super soft, um, not astringent at all, very, very bright. Um, I like the little like hay and straw, more like kernel notes that I got to it. There is a, that bit of depth, um, but I think that it's just like a very easy drinking, you know, there's a little bit of chalkiness, there's a little bit of seashore in there, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, you know, this is a wine for me that's always easy to underestimate. You know, I think it's kind of fun for those of you that did the flight um, to experience it having been poured out by four ounces. You know, it's kind of like a mini decanter, those little, you know, glass jars. So this wine comes into its own. Um, when you first taste it, after you open a bottle, it's kind of lean. Um, but as it opens up, you get a lot more of that fruit. And uh, what is seductive about these wines for me is the way um, uh, the texture um, you know, tends to evolve. So, you know, most white wines, you know, they're just, they're crisp or clean, but, you know, texturally, um, you know, they have a little less to offer than reds. This has the textural dimension of a red, um, but wrapped in this white, you know, envelope uh, for the sake of the qualities of the fruit. Um, and, you know, that offers all these opportunities uh, for the sake of uh, trying these wines uh, with food that don't, you know, otherwise exist uh, for the sake of, of more conventional uh, white wines. Um, what do you have uh, in the way of questions, uh, Zoe, uh, from uh, everyone uh, in the mix today? Um, absolutely. Is it common for white wines to be foot trotted or just the reds? That is a excellent, that's an excellent question. I have no idea, Zoe. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know that in Portugal. Um, I have some hipster German buddies um, uh, in uh, Baden-Württemberg um, that uh, trod their white wines with feet. Um, and actually sell it at the restaurant. It's a uh, Müller-Turgau uh, called Bunstanstein. 
Um, uh, and, uh, you know, so there's no reason that you couldn't do that with a white wine. You know, uh, trotting something with your feet tends to be more extractive. You know, so you, you tend to get more of those like bitter, harsh kind of flavors when you do that. So, you know, typically that's not something that you seek out for the sake of a white wine. So people would be less want to, um, you know, kind of uh, work the grapes that way. But there's no reason that you can't, you know, there, there, um, there's no reason that, you know, if you're looking for more structure out of a white wine, that you can't do that. And so it's not unheard of. Um, I know of no tradition of it in, in, in uh, this corner of the world. And it should be said that neither of these wines are made in Lagarde. So um, actually, uh, it's part of the codification of this designation of origin that they don't, um, by law, um, uh, trod the grapes by foot. Um, they de-stem the grapes. Um, so they take them off the stems and crush them and throw them immediately into the clay jars. So there are no feet. Uh, this is a foot-free wine. <laughs> Those of you uh, who are worried about your consumption of, uh, you know, uh, Portuguese, uh, you know, uh, foot microbiota uh, over the course of, of this particular lesson. Um, what else do you guys have? So? Oh, what's the difference between amphora and like the pupils that we were talking about for the espiral? Um, in, the, in the, sorry, the what? In the espiral. Um, so the, it should be said amphora is a, a very um, narrow um, uh, classification for a particular uh, um, uh, kind of Roman, uh, uh, Greco-Roman vessel that has two handles and then a particular flared shape, um, uh, you know, like an hourglass figure of sorts. Um, you know, uh, so um, it's a very narrow um, uh, term, but um, it's ascribed more broadly just to clay pots that contain things. So um, in, in this case, uh, tala would be, you know, the, the proper designation. So you can see that's the shape of the vessel, um, uh, you know, actually. Um, is, is and, and I'll, I'll share a screen um, for the sake of a uh, you know a proper you know room full of these vessels um, that looks a little alien you know when you have a lot of amphora in a room um, it, it gets a little you know shining Stephen King um, for whatever reason uh, but uh, you know these are a bunch of tala um, in a a, 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 a cob in, in Portugal um, you know but uh, technically these are, are tala and not amphora. Um, uh, the term amphora re refers to a specific Greco-Roman vessel, but it has become synonymous with just clay pots that are used um, to uh, handle and transport wine, um, you know, more broadly speaking. Uh, and, 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 you know, in, Portu in, in rather Georgia, um, kind of works the same way. So, you know, we'll say, you know, uh, you know Georgian amphora, but, you know, Cabevery is kind of its, its own thing, um, you know, significantly. Uh, what else you got? Yeah, there was a follow-up question of how these amphora are different from the Georgian Cavevries, and then if they are both wax lined or if that's just the Georgian Cavevries. Excellent, excellent question. So no, I know that's that's a killer question. So um, the uh, the Georgian uh, Cavevri uh, typically are fired at a um, lower temperature, um, so they're more porous, so they have to be lined. Um, typically, it's, it's beeswax resin, actually, um, and not uh, beeswax, um, which I actually think is, is actually more impermeable. Um, and uh, so uh, that's why beeswax on Cavevri. Um, and the Portuguese Tala uh, generally uh, fired at a higher temperature, so they are um, uh, uh, kind of uh, impermeable, uh, they, that, that they're not as porous as the Georgian Cavevri. Um, and furthermore, they're above ground. Um, as opposed to buried in the womb of the earth. Um, and they're a lot easier to work with because you can just like, uh, like tapping a keg, you kind of tap a tala. Um, and actually there's a, a famous um, uh, kind of festival. Uh, so the, uh, I think it's St. Martin. Um, I have it somewhere in my notes here, but uh, it's St. Martin's festival. Um, it's November 11th, um, which is, you know, uh, it is St. Martin. So November 11th in Alentejo, uh, they tap the tala um, and, you know, they draw the line out of the bottom. Um, you know, if your amphora are buried, you don't really have that option. It's a lot more cumbersome to draw the line off. So I, I had myself thinking that, you know, uh, you know, for a long time I was, you know, uh, indulging the notion of making wine in Cavevri, but, um, you know, the lazy man in me thinks, you know, uh, I would much rather tap a tala uh, than have to, uh, you know, uh, peel off the seal on a cabevery and, and draw the wine off that way. Uh, so I'm going to come back for questions. I really want to uh, uh, tackle these three wines because um, they're equally delightful. 
Um, and, uh, you know, we are going long on time. Thank you all for, um, you know, uh, resisting the urge to tune into Puppy Bowl um, this long. Uh, although I should say, uh, I think Jill Biden is making an appearance on, on Puppy Bowl later. I'm very excited about that. Um, so we're gonna tackle Lisboa now. So Lisboa, the region around Lisbon, um, and we're gonna tackle these like really awesome historic wines. So uh, the first one up uh, is gonna be this Castelao from Castel Figuera. Uh, Figuera. Uh, apologies uh, for my Portuguese pronunciation from all of you, um, you know, joining us from home. We actually had a lot of honest to God Portuguese speakers, um, uh, native Portuguese joining us. Um, and uh, I hope you're keeping me honest uh, at home for the sake of my uh, mispronunciations. But um, this is a, a really kind of like bittersweet um, uh, project. So Marta Suarez, the winemaker and artist, uh, her husband, Antonio Cabralo, um, passed away in 2009. Uh, they fell in love because he rented warehouse space to make his wines north of Lisbon uh, next to her. And, and she was inspired by his passion um, to join the wine trade um, and uh, took up his banner, um, uh, made the wines, um, you know, after he passed away. So uh, this comes from Castellau vines. And um, the kind of theme of this lesson is, is uh, sandy soil. So we talked uh, schist, granite, limestone briefly for the sake of the Dona Maria. Here we're dealing with sand, we're dealing with own rooted vines. So uh, own rooted is a whole nother lesson, but uh, the idea, these are ungrafted vines. Uh, most uh, uh, grape vines are grafted onto different root stock um, that is flocks or resistant. These are, are grape vines that are on their own root stock, uh, which is very special. Um, uh, these are 50 uh, to 60 year old vines. Castellau is the grape, which is one of the most widely grown grapes in Portugal that you don't hear a lot about. Um, it's kind of like Pinot. Um, this is a wine that uh, is aged on the stems and seeds. So this is whole cluster alert. Um, so they add the stems to the mix and these whole cluster wines, they tend to have this like wonderfully herbaceous dimension to them. I adore this. Um, I've not had this um, before uh, we took on this particular class. I think it's, you know, fucking gorgeous um, uh, bottle. Uh, Zoe, thoughts about this particular offering? Gorgeous. It is all of the stinky feet that like wet leather. Um, it is very poopy, but in all of the best ways. Um, I really like the quality of the fruit here as well. Um, there is like a soured complexity to the fruit, but it's also very dry. And that's where I think that like um, Burgundian style goes in, yeah. although you and I both hate using that term sometimes. Um, but it's just absolutely delicious. Yeah, so- I think um, it's too. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really stunning. Um, so she is uh, in uh, this uh, village called uh, Vermeira. Um, uh, there's a, a ridge of mountains um, that kind of uh, runs north to south that serves as, you know, um, a cooling influence for her vines, but um, she is uh, just north of uh, Lisbon uh, for the sake of this project, but for the sake of, you know, older vineyards. Um, and, you know, it's all stainless steel, so really pure expression of, of Castellau um, as such. But we're moving on now to Colarish, um, which is this, you know, historically sig uh, significant um, uh, wine. Uh, it's called the Bordeaux of uh, Portugal. Um, it is the ultimate uh, beach wine, uh, Calarish. Um, and uh, this one's a 1999, uh, so uh, RIP uh, Prince, uh, but we're gonna party with him. Uh, you know, we're drink, drinking like it's 1999. Uh, the grape here is called Rumishko, very much like uh, Nebbiolo. These are own rooted vines as well, planted essentially in a beach. So you see the sprawling vines here um, and uh, you know, they have to dig down through the sand to plant on the, um, you know, mother clay, and then they mound up the sand over it. Um, uh, sand is extremely well draining, and it tends to give wines that are even softer than the wines that you'll see on granite. Uh, it tends to give wines, you know, that are, you know, plush and delicate. But Remisco is a grape that has this, like, crazy tannic dimension to it. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's high acid, high tannin, um, and so it needs age, it needs the sandy soils to tame it. Um, and uh, this is a wine region that almost disappeared. Um, so, you know, you went from hundreds of acres, thousands of acres under vine uh, for the sake of this particular offering, you know, to, um, you know, mere hundreds um, uh, in uh, the modern era. Um, and this comes from uh, uh, a uh, kind of unique um, and informative uh, uh, celebrant of uh, this particular culture um, in Palo de Silva, um, uh, a, a true, um, you know, kind of a, a Portuguese wine 
um, OG uh, for um, the sake of uh, Antonio uh, uh, Berardino here. He's well into his 90s. Um, he is this kind of like, um, you know, uh, kind of formative figure in Portuguese wine, um, in the history of Colarish, um, in the history of um, kind of uh, really being a, a standard bearer for a wine that was almost uh, forgotten, almost swept off the earth. So you, you're close enough to Lisbon here that the land is, is more often uh, valuable uh, as, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, exurban resort than it is as vineyard. And it's very hard to work these uh, sandy vines. You have to, you know, initially after the fruit sets, you have to, you know, kind of prop up the fruit above the sand. Uh, so that's not, you know, uh, too, um, you know, exposed um, to uh, the moisture that will, um, you know, kind of uh, collect uh, along uh, the sand. So the grapes don't rot. Um, it's a very much a passion project, uh, but uh, Antonio um, continued to beat that drum um, and continued to uphold, um, you know, the tradition and has brought it into the modern era. And, you know, this is a wine that, you know, tastes uh, like, um, you know, antiquity. It's, it's a wine that tastes stately and old fashioned um, in the best possible way. And you can see, you know, we're not literally along the beach. You know, these are, uh, you know, rugged cliffs above the Atlantic. Um, and then the vines are, are perched, um, you know, there uh, above. But, you know, you have that waft of sea spray, you know, these low slung fences uh, protecting it uh, from, you know, the, the, you know, kind of uh, from the sea, you know, and, you know, that's, that salt itself is poisonous uh, to uh, the vines, you know, yet in, this, in spite of, you know, the very uh, difficult, you know, marginal uh, conditions, you know, the wine uh, endures and survives and you have something from 98 that's delicate um, and elegant, uh, but persistent uh, nonetheless. Um, uh, what do you taste uh, for the sake of this wine, Zoe? And do you have any people that are, are commenting on it? Uh, yeah, this wine is absolutely gorgeous. I love Palo de Silva. Um, thank you so much for bringing in all of the whites and the reds of, of Palo de Silva over the few years. Um, I, I like how chunky it is. Um, I think that the um, decayed fruit is also really beautiful. All of that potpourri, a little bit of um, balsamic coming in, um, but not just a not just the tertiary notes, but like you can really get, I keep on saying the seashore, but I guess it's kind of the point of this lesson, but there's just like that niçoise, like black olive brine in here and like a little bit of like caper juice. And that may not seem delicious and scrumptious on its own, but I don't know, they all come together and, and make this like brooding kind of earthier savory baby that I love. Um, so Zoe, I never thought about juicing capers until you just mentioned it, but now I kind of want to juice, juice capers, but. Uh, it is, it is there. Um, and, you know, I love that this is, you know, a, a wine that flies in the face of the notion that, you know, something has to be cartoonishly big to endure. You know, this is a delicate wine um, that's savory um, and, you know, racy, uh, but equally uh, enduring at 12% alcohol, uh, which is a minor miracle. Um, and then we're going to close out with uh, Carcavelos. Um, let me take more questions. I'd love to talk more about these, but uh, Carcavelos is a fortified wine. So this is um, uh, very much like port, uh, very much like Madeira. Um, it's one of four classic uh, vinos generosos from Portugal, the other one, uh, 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 Setubal, which is uh, from just south of here. So Setubal is a, a Malvasia floral wine from here, uh, from, from like the peninsula to the south of Lisboa. But we're in Carcavelos here. Um, it is a, a historically significant uh, wine. Uh, it um, uh, was widely traded uh, amongst, um, you know, kind of the uh, Euro aristocrats of the 18th and 19th century. Um, it was one of the first uh, wines uh, that uh, Sotheby's Auction House, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, kicked off its, or sorry, Christie's Auction House. I, I got that wrong. I'm sure, I'm sure Sotheby's has auctioned it as well, but uh, Christie celebrated it in its uh, first ever auction. Um, and uh, TJ, uh, Thomas Jefferson, terrible businessman, uh, spent way too much money on wine, but I had great taste and loved Carcavelos, but uh, in the modern era, again, you're too close to a major metropolitan area and people would rather look out on the sea than uh, work the vines. So uh, in this case, uh, you have Carcavelos that um, encompasses uh, dozens of acres, dozens of hectares rather, um, uh, in, in this era, but um, it is nonetheless, you know, really um, amazing and being in the midst of revival, um, this particular state 
um, is the outgrowth of the work of uh, Manuel de Pulosa, who sadly, um, you know, passed away within the last decade, but purchased it in 1963, spent the better part of several decades reviving the vineyards. It's a blend of Arinto, which is a hugely significant acid-driven uh, uh, Portuguese white varietal, Gallego and uh, Dorado, and uh, so Gallego Dorado and, and Retino. Uh, but Arinto gives it that racy, uh, live quality. Uh, it's a wine that has spirit added um, like ports uh, before it's finished fermentation that preserves some of the sugar then aged at length uh, in uh, oak thereafter. This is 1989. It's a great year for music, a great year um, for um, Carcavelos. Uh, and uh, really, really special stuff. Um, you know, I think this is a wine I want to eat cheese with. It's a wine I want to eat, um, you know, pork with. Um, uh, hopefully some of uh, you, you know, uh, you know, got in on the roast pork that we were offering uh, for Super Bowl Sunday. I encourage you to save some of this wine uh, to go along with it. Uh, Zoe, what do you get uh, as far as tasting notes for the sake of this particular offering? I mean, I think this is why you and I adore sherry and can go on and on and on about these things. Like, it's a little fortified. You get all that saltiness, all of that nuttiness. Clearly, like, this is its own and of itself. It's very different from sherry, of course, but, like, being able to put it into that category um, I think it's like very gastronomic and being able to um, pair with really interesting foods like that chicken liver mousse. I think I would love um, with this wine or even on, on its own. You know that like Indian dessert, shahi tukra? Um, it's yeah. like with all that little brown sugar, like in the honey, yeah. like this is with, like figgy pruniness. Um, I think it just evokes all of those types of um, flavors and aromas and it's just, you know, gorgeous. I want to drink this for forever. Yeah, the Portuguese do a lot of these like... Uh kind of like richer tarts for dessert, like eggy tarts. And I feel like this is tailor made for that. Uh, but I, I, I hear you though. I think equally a lot of Indian food would be, you know, absolutely banging with this stuff because it has that like exotic, you know, kind of baking spice quality uh, to it as well. Um, so I'm gonna toast out and then we have, I, I hope, uh, you know, some additional questions uh, to field and I'm excited to uh, field them. But uh, I just wanna thank you all for joining us, whether this is again, uh, lesson number 42 or lesson uh, numero uno. I wish I knew how to say that in Portuguese, but um, you know, uh, Portugal, this land that, that time forgot, a series of wines uh, that time forgot, but there is this wonderful nobility in that. And I think, you know, for those of us, um, you know, that, that live in places with, you know, a, a shorter memory. So, you know, on this side of the Atlantic, you know, we don't have, you know, that same sense of tradition. And then, you know, in places like, you know, Bordeaux, Burgundy, the Mosul Valley, you know, uh, they stayed continuously popular in a way that, you know, um, you know, constantly innovated, but didn't preserve, um, you know, these lessons from uh, antiquity. But, you know, I, I love, you know, this notion that, um, you know, we do uh, have something to learn uh, from, um, you know, these, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, time capsules um, of the wine world. Uh, and Portugal very much uh, embodies that. Uh, for me. And, and I, um, you know, want to continue to drink the wines and continue to learn more about them and continue to celebrate them. So uh, thank you for joining us all, uh, wherever you are drinking from alone together uh, tonight, today, as always. Cheers. So what do you got? Um, you alluded to this a little earlier, but I was wondering if you could elaborate about exactly how you take wine out of cavaveries when they're buried underneath the earth. Oh, this is, this is really good. Uh, oh my God, <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, so um, great question. Uh, so typically there are a lot of different ways to do it. Like historically, honestly, they would have just kind of like ladled off. Uh, but in modern era, they just use a pump. Uh, most people, they'll just use a, a small pump uh, to, to do so um, uh, in, in most, in most wineries or you can, you can siphon as well. Um, but uh, uh, usually just a small one. Um, how popular in the world are sandy soil region, wine regions? Um, and then what are your other favorite sandy soil wine regions? Well, to, um, I should have that, you know, on the tip of my tongue, but I, I don't. So, um, you know, there are, that's, that's, that's great. That's great stuff. Um, I, I can't think of, you know, so the, this, like Kolaris is uniquely sandy. It's like, you know, um, the beach is that way, you know, beach wine, sandy, um, in a way that a lot of other zones don't replicate. Um, you know, so, so sand is coarse. Um, uh, and, 
uh, you know, it's, it's very well draining. So sand will slop water. It's not water retentive at all in the way that like clay or silt are. Um, and that can be valuable in, in warmer corners of the world. I, I, I don't know, maybe I've, I've been reading too much about Portugal today and it's been, it's been a weird, it's been a, like a strange weekend. So I can't, I can't summon that off the top of my head uh, in terms, I should, I should have like, uh, I feel like, so do you have any like classic like sandy terroirs that you can think of off the top of your head? Cause I, um, I say like Greek, a lot of different uh, Greek. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, so Santorini. Or, well, I mean, you, but, but the, that, that qualifies as volcanic for me more than just sandy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, you have a lot of like really classic volcanic, you know, soils that are, um, that have a lot of same properties that sand do, uh, uh, the sands do, but in terms of like, you know, sandier soils, um, it, it does some like unique things, um, uh, in, in regions. And, and so your maritime regions are, are very, um, you know, wet. And so to have sand that just sloughs water is very valuable for a plant in the grapevine that doesn't like to have its feet wet. Um, you know, but I, I don't have a good answer. I, I promise to address that answer at length uh, tomorrow when I kick myself for not thinking, thinking of things. But, you know, there, there, there are quite a few. And, and a lot of it has to do with like how mother rock degrades, you know? So, um, you know, you think about the bedrock, we talked about niche, we talked about granite, but wine doesn't grow in niche of granite. It grows on the topsoil that like eventually evolves from degraded niche and granite. And different rocks have different properties in terms of how they degrade. So like granite makes coarser sand. And gneiss, because it's like kind of flaky, makes smaller kind of, uh, you know, clay and silt. Um, so, um, you know, I think of, you know, these like granitic soils that evolve into sand as, as producing these like lusher wines. Alsace has a lot of granite. Um, you know, a lot of other corners of the world do. But, um, you know, it, it's too late on Sunday. Um, and, you know, and I'm just not firing on all cylinders. So I apologize, but uh, I, I promise to circle back to that question. Yeah, I think there's like a few little places in like Chile and in Argentina that also have like 80% soil or sandy soils, but I, I'm yeah. not being able to like pull out specific regions. Um, there's also a few places in Australia as well in Western Australia. Um, but again, I wanna, I'm gonna put a little pin in that and go research. Yeah, that, I mean, it, that, I, and, you know, in as much as, you know, you all, you know, ask questions, it is equally satisfying for us to, you know, close the loop um, and think about things that we should have thought of that we didn't. Um, a great question about um, Portuguese wine tradition influences in all of the places that they have colonized over the world. Did they have as much of an impact as like France and Spain? Yeah, I think I think about that a lot because there's actually this really amazing corner of, uh, I mean, they're like these weird corners of of the world that have, so like Boston randomly has this like huge Azorian like uh, like uh, Azorian Island and like Cape Verde Island community. So there's like good Portuguese food in like you know in these like random enclaves of like Providence and Boston, and you know sadly they didn't bring any wine with them. Um, uh, there, there's some like comparable you know, enclaves um, out West. Um, I think like Pecone Punch, you know, in like, um, I think a cocktail tradition rather, you know, out West. Um, but I don't think the Portuguese brought their grapes. I mean, they, I'm sure they brought the grapes with them. They just didn't, um, they didn't, you know, take root the same way Italian grapes did. So, you know, in throughout, you know, uh, Argentina, throughout um, California, you see this like, continuous line of Italian immigrant, you know, viticulture. Um, I can't think of areas where that has the same continuity um, in the Portuguese speaking world. Um, there is wine in Brazil. So like uh, uh, in like Southern Brazil, um, uh, like Rio Grande do Sur, there's like uh, sparkling wine, but I don't know much about it. Um, and Portuguese, like the Portuguese have this really fascinating relationship with Brazil. So like, one of the final, one of the last, you know, real kings of Portugal kind of like gave up. He just like resigned, <laughs> resigned his Portuguese, like Portugal, you know, Portuguese like citizenship because he loved Brazil so much, um, you know. And and I, I don't know, I don't, I love that about Portuguese and Brazilian history. But like, um, you know, th there are Portuguese grapes that have made their way throughout the Americas, um, but there's not the same continuity 
um, you know, for the sake of those grapes surviving into the modern era as there is for the sake of Spanish grapes, in particular Italian grapes um, and French varietals. Um, well, French varietals more introduced, like we didn't have a ton of Huguenots, but Spanish and, and, and Spanish and Italian have survived. But um, to the best of my knowledge, um, and then again, I'll, I'll do more reading on it, uh, uh, less so Portuguese. Absolutely. Um, do you think that you want to put just a feet wine category for Reveler's Hour to get all of our foot trodden? Yeah, that sounds fun. So we definitely, so um, that sounds fun. Uh, we, we definitely have like an Anfora, like a clay, wine and clay, like a burgeoning uh, section. Um, and we've been talking about that a lot lately. Like, you know, so what does clay give to a wine? And, and there is a definable signature for me that's like electric and savory. So, you know, clay tends to um, amplify the, um, you know, the acid on a, on a wine and kind of diminish the fruit and like uh, plus one, the like briny, you know, you know, kind of quality of it. And if you like that, I think there is this like um, familiar resemblance in, you know, and for a clay age wines, that's really seductive. Um, and, you know, I kind of intend to follow that to the ends of the earth. And I feel like one of my first big trips after, you know, uh, coronavirus uh, lifts is to visit like Luisha and to visit Pedro and like kind of, you know, you know, maybe tread some grapes with my feet, but also like see how they're working in Enfora. Cause it's just like, there's something seductive about those wines. I don't know what it is. It's just like, it sinks its, it sinks its teeth into you and you can't, you can't forget it. You know, there's something, it just feels very alive to me and alive in a, like a really awesome, like, not like, like kind of mousy natty way in just like a very honest, like, you know, there's, you know, this life force to this wine, you know, it feels like a living being uh, in a way that, you know, is tremendously evocative and appealing kind of way that I want to step into. Uh, but uh, as far as the foot trodden thing goes, I'll, I'll do, I'll do more digging. I fear that, you know, people will come into the wine store and they'll just be like no more red, white, you know, you know, rosé and it'll only be like clay, but <laughs> you know, just be like a series of, of like categories, like American oak, a series of categories that are just like so confounding that people will come in and those like immediately leave. Um, but hopefully we're able to like balance those, you know, impetuses in a way that will be, you know, kind of fun. Uh, well, let's bring it back to like a, to a different level of question then. Um, where does earthiness come from in wine? If it's made from fruit, if it's made from grapes, why doesn't it just taste like fruit? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a philosophical question. So, you know, why does something that is from a grape taste ungrapey? Um, you know, that's, that is the miracle of wine. So you have one, you know, singular vector in vitis vinifera, um, and it has all of these different multifaceted expressions that, you know, are very ungrapey. Um, and, you know, that is, that's the, that's the glory um, of it all. That is the mystery of, of it all. That is the rabbit hole to, to dive down. Um, you know, the, um, the variability, you know, of this, you know, single, single creature. You know, I think that's what, you know, you come, come to love about it. Um, you know, earthiness in particular, like minerality, um, which is a weird word to ascribe to wine, like all those things, where, where did it, from whence do they derive? Um, you know, I think for those of us that love wine, um, they derive from place, they derive from the singularity of terroir. Um, and, you know, we talked about that in the context of, you know, the Portuguese discovering, rediscovering port. So, you know, the, the you know, port was a, a product, you know, and it was a blend of, um, you know, wines from a lot of these different small holders. And you had these huge houses like Symington that collected all these brands and shipped them down river and then blended them and aged them in, um, this commercial center, uh, you know, on the southern end of the river in Port, um, you know, but the rediscovering, you know, wines of place and people like Antio Antonio Lopez Ribeiro, he grew up among the vines, um, are rediscovering, you know, um, the through line from the vine to the bottle. Um, and, you know, that's where um, Earth comes from, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's in the purity of expression. It's in that establishing that continuity between what you grow and, you know, what you work at and the hours that you invest 
in the vineyard um, and, and transmitting that in the bottle. That is, you know, that's the secret sauce. You know, the people that do it well, you know, the people that are sufficiently tuned to it, you know, that's, that's what makes it all worthwhile. And, 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 you know, it doesn't always exist, you know, in all wines. I, I think, you know, even for the sake of wines we, we, you know, tasted today, like, you know, the stuff that has more of a preponderant new oak influence, like, especially like I love the Donna Maria, but I would struggle to identify that as, as Portuguese, you know? I think it's, I, I, it's good wine and it's just, it exists as good wine. And I think it's fun that it's from Portugal, but it doesn't necessarily like say Portugal to me, you know, whereas like, I think the Lopez Rivero does have something to say about, you know, tr like, you know, the Corey Haim, Corey, you know, uh, Feldman Portuguese, like Trigo Nacional, Franca blend thing, um, you know, and, 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 you know, those are always the, you know, that's where I want to, you know, go, you know, the, the, you know, the, the things that are, you know, fun for their own sake and like could come from anywhere. Like they're great. Like they're, you know, they can be fun, but you know, the, you know, the more, the, the, the ones you want to marry, you know, are the ones that, you know, you know, kind of actually have something to say about a particular, you know, designation of board. What else you got? Well said. That's all I got for today. Any last minute questions? No, well, um, uh, thank you for following us this far down the rabbit hole, all of you. Uh, I think the Super Bowl starts in like an hour or so. Uh, I hope you're all rooting against uh, Tom Brady. Um, although it did, it did strike me that we're uh, embracing uh, his wife's uh, mother tongue uh, for the sake of, of this particular lesson. Um, one of my favorite uh, Tom Brady uh, anecdotes was like uh, Giselle saying, he cannot throw the ball and catch the ball. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, we're thrilled to have you all with us um, and, uh, you know, irrationally excited that uh, uh, we had a whole bunch of, of first timers in the mix. Um, if you are joining us for the first time and, and managed to hang on uh, this long, uh, we promise you there are, um, you know, an infinite uh, array of rabbit holes to fall down. Uh, I'll have a new uh, invitation uh, coming your way um, uh, on Tuesday and uh, look forward to doing it all again uh, for a good cause uh, next Sunday. So, solid.